he's been actually columnist for the Georgia Strait for almost 30 years. And uh, he's now going to talk about and, and uh, probably sign some copies of his latest book, which is another book on day trips from Vancouver. So uh, I think he's probably just got enough information. I don't need to actually apply you with any more. Please welcome Jack. Thanks everybody, great to be here with you. And thank you so much for inviting me, Bela. It's a real treat to uh, be in a room of uh, like-minded folks. Uh, my assignment for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> my assignment for the next 45 minutes or so is to entertain you. And of course, as travel writers, as writers in general, that's our job. We entertain, first and foremost. If you can't entertain your audience, then you've lost them after the first couple of sentences, unless they're really into some you know, very deep uh, scholarship. And so, uh, of course, what I uh, have uh, brought together this morning is a little talk on ecotourism. I've got a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, sort of midway through it, I'm going to throw in a little video there for, uh, for your viewing pleasure. Uh, yes, uh, <coughs> first we entertain. Then we illuminate, then we educate, then we inspire, then we encourage. But uh, first of all, entertainment is what it's all about. And, you know, at first plus, eco ecotourism sounds rather earnest, doesn't it? Uh, so what I've tried to do today is put together uh, something that I hope that you really find inspiring. Of course, my uh, specialty, and it's served me well for 30 years now, is I'm a regional specialist. And these days, with uh, more and more focus on traveling locally. That has really served me well. The whole mantra of one tank trips is uh, what our new book is all about. Why don't you show the folks the copy? This is our new baby. It just came out. Our uh, first book was published in 1988, and since then, as uh, Vela has alluded to, uh, my wife and I have done uh, about 18 books, maybe not all together, but because I've worked on them. Uh, some of them just by myself on assignment for things like Northwest Best Places. I don't know if that title is still around. Remember uh, Best Places to Kiss in the Northwest? And I got a chance to get out there and tour the province and really take a look at uh, when ecotourism was just starting out and it had that cachet and it's really interesting to see where it's evolved since then. I think I first came across the term ecotourism uh, probably in about the early 2000s. Uh, it really had some cachet at the time. Now I find that it's, uh, it's a bit of a whitewash term. Uh, but I want to show you some really uh, genuine uh, examples of what I think uh, local ecotourism. And I've thrown in a couple of things a little further afield from the Lower Mainland as well. But anyway, here's our new baby. Uh, I brought lots of copies. I brought lots of copies. Uh, okay, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody know where the cover photo was taken? I'll give away a book to uh, whoever can tell me where that photo was taken. Whistler. Can you folks over here see the screen? No. <laughs> uh, Pit Meadows? Battleship Islands, Garibaldi. You got it, Pontiac. Oh, oh, there you go. Oh, Battleship Islands is where you can count, oh. count there. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Battleship Islands. Yeah. Oh, wow. One more time. Yes. All right. Thanks, Brian. Good call. So yeah, we've got uh, we've got five of these that my publisher Greystone Books has kindly donated for this afternoon, uh, and so I think uh, it'll be you know given away at, when your prize draws are happening. Um, I feel badly that there's people sitting here who can't see the screen. Maybe should I move the podium over? No, here? don't no. do that. Don't touch the. Podium. <laughs> no, no, no. No. Okay, don't touch the podium. move the post. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, it's interesting. Ecotourism. You know, I did a little research. As I love stats, I inhale stats, and uh, the most recent stats on ecotourism. 
49% of people surveyed said if they were going to go on an ecotourism trip, it would be Costa Rica, closely followed by Cuba. So I thought that, that was uh, really interesting because I just, uh, uh, a fellow journalist, uh, Rob Meckleborough, who used to be the uh, reporter for the Globe and Mail, Rod has a great blog, and he just blogged about taking a trip to Costa Rica where uh, Everything was, uh, it was an expensive trip to start with, it was an ecotourism trip, the hotels were awful, uh, he, they couldn't see any of the sites that, uh, that were prominent, it's a lot like here, you know, you can walk into uh, Battleship Island on Garibaldi and it's, uh, you know, it can be socked in, you know, I've known people who went to Mount Baker four times before they actually saw the mountain, so it happens. Um, the, uh, the other thing that was interesting was they asked uh, people in the states, okay, what are the cities that you would identify in the United States that are the most uh, eco-friendly, eco-tourism friendly? And it was San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. And I would say that Vancouver can compete on an equal footing with any of those three, uh, not just on the point of view from an eco-tourism point of view, but just from scenery, from ease of getting around, you know, so I think uh, we're doing a really good job here. As the panelists this morning, uh, you know, we're highlighting a lot of the uh, local advantages of writing about tourism locally. And I know that Vancouver is hot because I did a story last year for the KLM Air France uh, in-flight magazine. And they focused on two cities. One was Vancouver, the other was Paris. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good company that we're keeping there. Um, the uh, uh, ecotourism, by definition, is where dollars flow to locals and help protect an endangered environment. Uh, well, uh, dollars spent locally, we know where they go. Uh, protecting the environment, you don't have to look any further than the oil spill that happened this week in our harbor here to understand how really vulnerable uh, our ecology system is. And in fact, the, uh, the cover of the Georgia Strait this week has got endangered species with a uh, picture of a leopard frog on it, which is uh, endangered because of uh, habitat intrusion that's happening locally. <coughs> Frogs are like one of those canary in the mine shafts, really indicator species of what's going on. So, if you were to uh, go on a tour locally, and here's something that I would encourage you all to do, and it's a great story potential. There's a geologist named David Cook, who is very well spoken. He works with Nature Vancouver, the Vancouver Natural History Society. And he conducts maybe three, four tours a month that go and look at a variety of interesting geological um, locations around Vancouver. These are free trips. They encourage you to join uh, Nature Vancouver, which has been around for over 100 years now, uh, after about you've taken your third trip. But I really think that this has uh, got a lot of story potential when you're uh, portraying Vancouver to the world or wherever your readers are. And uh, I've gone out to Pacific Spirit Park with him. I've gone to uh, the Lower Seymour Conservation Reserve. You will learn more from traveling with David uh, in an afternoon than you could possibly imagine. You know, we take a lot for granted in our local uh, environment here. Why don't we do another slide? Everybody's been waiting for this one. Let's go! Let's go traveling with Jack. This, I love this. And I think there's room in here for all of us here. Um, there wouldn't be, I mean, this is, this is my choice in the background there. <laughs> But uh, a friend of mine, you know, we were traveling in the wilderness doing the Stein Traverse, and you had to go up this awful, awful logging road to get to the top of the road. And at the, you know, it was culverted and ditched, and I didn't even think that our trusty Volvo was going to make it. We got up to the top, and there's a Westphalia, and, and two skinny Frenchmen, and uh, with no disrespect intended, mes uh, amis uh, français ici. So. Let's get all aboard and away we go. Anybody been out with Takaya tours? Okay. Boy, is this an incredible way to get a, a, a new view of Vancouver from a First Nations point of view. Takaya tours is run out of North Vancouver. The uh, 
the inspiration for Takaya was Chief Dan George, who I think is probably one of the best known First Nations leaders that Canada has ever produced. And it's run by his children. And Chief Dan George's feeling was, uh, if people only knew the First Nations history, uh, the, the, uh, a whole new world would open. And Takaya Tours run uh, out of North Vancouver, close to <coughs> Deep Cove. In fact, they're based right out of uh, Kate's Park, uh, Slewa Tooth uh, uh, Park, just uh, near Deep Cove. And they take folks out in these lovely replicas of uh, the boat that um, Bill Reed carved, the uh, wave cutter. And everybody gets in the boat, and that's the whole thing, right? We're all in this together. And that's uh, a sentiment, you know, we're all in the same canoe together. We had a visitor from Senegal, that's the motto of Senegal. Nous sommes tous dans la même pirogue. And a pirogue is, um, I haven't got quite the word right. Um, anyway, it's, we're all in the same canoe together. I think that would be a, a really good way to approach a tour like this from a ecotourism point of view. Uh, they provide a, a First Nations lunch that goes along with it. So I would really encourage you, if you're looking for a story potential, to tell the story locally of First Nations people, the Kaya Tours in North Vancouver. Here's another great tour. I know we had Lotus Land Tours this morning. I just briefly wanted to mention the uh, Land Sea Tours and Adventures. I went on a fam trip with them uh, last spring. and. Uh, they are very approachable for media uh, to take tours with them. They started small. This was a tour that I took. Why don't you go for the next slide? More interesting. We went up uh, from here, from picked up in front of uh, the uh, Vancouver Trade and Convention Center, went <coughs> out to Horseshoe Bay, had a great little tour. Horseshoe Bay has got a First Nations history that's quite interesting. And then got aboard Sewell Marinas, which runs, you know, they're a family that have been out in Deep Cove, uh, I mean, in Horseshoe Bay since the 1920s. Got in a big Zodiac, zoomed around House Sound, and for all the time that I paddled on House Sound, from a place like Porto Cove Provincial Park here, which is about halfway up the Sea to Sky Highway, I saw things on House Sound that I had never seen before. We pulled into Britannia Beach. We went to the Britannia Beach Mine Museum. Highly recommended. One of the best little museums uh, on the go, uh, including a fabulous little mineral museum. Uh, mining is one of Canada's biggest industries, uh, just behind tourism, of course. And uh, it's, it's really uh, quite a little tour. We went from there over to the Sea to Sky Gondola, which had just opened last year. Finished up at the Squamish uh, Tourism Center just on Highway 99 and had a great little briefing and then came home. Great day trip. And um, I find that not only are companies like Lancy Adventures open to approach for, uh, especially if you're on assignment, but don't be afraid to self-assign. Uh, call them up, talk to them, tell them I sent you. Or call up Tourism Vancouver. Uh, Amber Sessions, uh, no, I haven't got it quite right. In any case, they have a media pass. Anybody yeah. here got a Tourism Vancouver media pass? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hard to get. At, are they? Yeah. Okay. They give them a lot to people outside of Vancouver. No. Um, you have to have a very special test for them to give them to you if you live in Vancouver, which I think they're personally missing out on a huge thing because most of us that live here in Vancouver of audiences that are around the world. That's, That's right. right. And I just got uh, my pass for the very first time this year. So my feeling is they do want to draw more of us local writers into the loop. It includes uh, admission to about 50 different uh, sites uh, around Vancouver and uh, locally, uh, a little further afield. Um, like out on the, I think on the islands, there's some place there. But in any case, don't be afraid to ask. What, what's the worst that can happen? They can say no, right? But I think they really uh, understand that uh, local media has got a role, a much bigger role to play in publishing because it's like I was saying, it's that one tank trip. We are, you know, these are our people just outside the door here. The uh, the, the whole rubber traffic trade, as much as you go to a place like Whistler, 
which is number one, you know, uh, winter and summer sports resort in North America, they still rely 65 to 70 percent of the visitors come from the Lower Mainland. <coughs> and this has never been more uh, critical to a lot of tourism businesses than since the global financial crisis in 2008, mm -hmm. where things are just beginning to rebound now. Okay, let's have a look at another. Oh, here we go. This is a great success story. Anybody been up with uh, ZipTrack? ZipTrack started in 2002. It's a, uh, a venture in Whistler that now goes year round. And it was a couple of young guys who got this idea that wouldn't it be great to introduce people to the ancient rainforests, which there is still a lovely stretch of it. It runs between Whistler Mountain on one side and Blackcomb Mountain on the other. Right down the middle comes Fitzsimmons Creek. And that's where the zip line goes back and forth <coughs> among the trees. Um, and not one nail was used in the, they, they have these little platforms that you climb up to. Uh, they train you in the village, first of all. You see people in the village with the hard hats and the harnesses on. They give you a little experience of going back and forth. And if you're afraid of heights, this is either, one, a great way to confront your fear, or two, you don't have to zip. They, uh, they have little walking tours as well that take you through. And the zip lines go through the forest canopy from, say, a, a western hemlock to a cedar, over a, to a Douglas fir, over to a balsam. Uh, and at each stop, they acquaint you with the forest ecology. One of the big news stories that you'll want to follow this coming summer is they've just created a two kilometer long zip line, which is the longest zip line in the world, uh, rivaling the peak to peak gondola, which passes over top, which is in the Guinness Book World Record now. Uh, zip Trek has been so successful that they now have Mount Tremblant. They have, uh, you go to their website, it's, it's a great local success story. You travel at a maximum speed of about 80 kilometers an hour, if you want to. You can travel slowly, but if you really are into speed, this is, this is a great little place. And like I say, it's, it's the perfect de definition of an eco-tour. Not a single tree was harmed in the creation of this enterprise. Out in uh, Chilliwack, here's a really... This is a great place to go right now. I really encourage you to go and check out this great blue heron nature reserve. Herons are, are one of the uh, sort of the iconic bird species around, aren't they? And I really thought about them last week during that oil spill. Because when you go out along uh, the harbor out towards Point Grey on a, Arcadia Beach there, you see like a colony from Stanley Park that are fishing there all the time, every day. This great blue heron nature reserve in Chilliwack. Why don't we do another slide? Right now you want to go before the trees leaf out because there's a colony of about 60 nests out there. And the sound, it's like a barnyard. It's like this, this croak from our ancient past. You know, the, uh, I think one of the first um, bird fossils that have been found are herons. They're a, that first transition from dinosaurs into what became the birds, the bird species. The thing I like about this center, and it, the nice thing about this center is it's sponsored by their local Rotary Club. It's on a, uh, what used to be the site of a Canadian Forces base, and uh, they have a wonderful interpretation center there. They have free binoculars that they give out. They have free tours, and take your bikes because there's wonderful biking trails that run all the way through the forested land. There's bridges that the Canadian forces built uh, and left there. Uh, how about another slide? Let's see what this is. And it's also a great crossroads of trails. Louise took this picture, and what have we got going here? We've got the uh, Trans-Canada Trail. We have the Grotary Club Loop here. We have a, a variety because trails are becoming really, really popular. Uh, whether it's uh, the uh, just a, a local trail like around in the Chilliwack uh, Heron Reserve, or I have got a little video that I want to show you right now of a trail that I've been covering for the last 20 plus years as it's evolved.
<laughs> Hands up, baby. <laughs> you know, sitting is the new smoking. Yeah. Have you heard the news? Yes. yes. All right. So uh, we'll show the video, and then after the video, we're going to stand up. We're going to do a little celebrity fist pump. <laughs> Mary struggles. <laughs> That's a bit of a struggle here. You know, in, in preparing for the conference today, I was very interested in the word eco. Okay, where did it come from? How did it get into uh, such such currency? Um, eco is short, of course, for ecology. It's a branch of biology dealing with the relations of organisms to one another and their physical surroundings. So I started to collect what I saw being used as eco. One of my favorite new ones is eco chic. Eco chic is uh, what a, a, a a spa in Whistler advertises itself as. Uh, eco-friendly, of course, we all feel like we're eco-friendly in this room, correct? And a lot of places advertise themselves as eco-friendly. And maybe eco-friendly for them means free Wi-Fi? It's like, it's like I say, there's a lot of greenwashing that's going on on this. Um, of course, eco-terrorism. Uh, that word came into the sort of uh, language, I guess, in the mid-2000s when there were uh, people that were accused of being eco-terrorists driving uh, nails into trees yeah. to try to save forests. There was a very interesting article in Outside Magazine last, last year, I think it was, where a fellow who had been convicted of eco-terrorism in Denver, uh, it, was, it turned out that he had been set up by uh, uh, one of the U.S. government services who had encouraged him to go out and burn down a forest. Uh, and so he was free. He was, uh, the court finally saw the error of their way. Eco-zombie. I don't know what eco-zombie is, but I came across that, that term, and I thought that was uh, one of my favorite collections. And, of course, the, uh, there's the uh, author, Umberto Eco, one of my favorites. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. We do a draw for some books. OMG, <laughs> 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 Jack. Oh, we do the stand up? Holy, oh my God. Meanwhile, <laughs> the Vancouver Aquarium. <coughs> and one more. Charlene Chang. Where are you, Charlene? Gotta be here to win. <laughs> we, may, we may be okay. to protect the things that we love and one of the problems that we face today is that today's generation of young people spend the least amount of time outside of any generation in human history we need to have children out we need to have people out in order to see the world around that allows us to live and to to give us a good life what better place to experience the Sea to Sky Trail than along an 11 kilometer stretch between Whistler and Brandywine Falls Provincial Park, where the trail is in immaculate shape. That's where we'll head to meet up with Paralympic sit skier Brad Lenny. I think the Sea to Sky Trail is very unique in the fact that people with different disabilities, different levels of disabilities, uh, maybe not even disabilities, maybe someone with a stroller or uh, someone who just has a hard time walking. Just having a trail of this extent, going through the wilderness the way that it does, we never get to see that anywhere, and we never get to use something like that anywhere. 
as Brad Lenny demonstrates, even though this flagship trail is still a work in progress, many sections now welcome both heels and wheels. The Sea to Sky's route mirrors its stunning coast mountain surroundings. Trail builders skillfully contoured it with the terrain, back and forth through the forest, past waterfalls, rivers, and rugged rock formations. Our objective when we come into a trail like this is the sustainability. We want to leave minimal impact, so our motto has always been lightly on the land. We come through, we do our work, and when we leave, it's hard to believe that we've actually been through with the type of equipment that we've used. The Sea to Sky is a wonderful free amenity that cements the corridor's reputation for superbly built trails. One person you should know is world-renowned bike trials rider Ryan Leach. What I love about the Sea to Sky Trail is that it acts like a spine that gives access to a real network of trails. Sea to Sky is like the mellow that gives access to the mega. Tight quarters fly beside the trail in summer, just as snowflakes do in winter. This is one trail that welcomes all comers in all seasons. As Olympic gold medalist Becky Scott appreciates from personal experience, whether you're on snow or crushed gravel, what matters most is discovering a trail's many moods. My hope is that this project, the Sea to Sky Trail, enables uh, young people of all, and people of all generations the same, the same opportunities and affords them the ability to use the trails in the summer for biking or running, or, and in the winter for cross-country skiing or snowshoeing, whatever their wish. What impresses me every time I explore the Sea to Sky Trail is how it cozies up the supernatural features. Whether a thundering cascade like Brandywine Falls, a suspension bridge over the Callahan River, or the windswept Squamish waterfront. I would encourage all trail builders to uh, be inclusive in their planning for the trails, uh, just so that everybody can get out and enjoy the trail. You don't have to be disabled, but just to be out with your friends, your family, is so important and so rewarding. Thanks to both local and international sponsorship, each year the 190 <coughs> kilometer long trail grows closer to completion. Like a guiding light, the Sea to Sky Trail draws everyone into nature's magical realm. I think something like the Sea to Sky Trail is the epitome of what we need to get people back out into the real world, to see nature as it can be, and something that we are a part of and that we must fight to protect. To find out more about the Sea to Sky Trail, check our website, seatoskytrail.ca. Better yet, come on out and see the trail for yourself. I guarantee you, it'll get under your skin, charm your heart, and steal your soul every time. did an article on the Sea to Sky Trail, there was, it was the vision of one fellow, Raj Kirkwood, and I went out and I visited with him uh, when he was working on the first couple of kilometers of it, and it's still, as it says in the video, a work in progress. Uh, 195 kilometers long, you can go out and do it in really nice bite-sized pieces, and again, I think this is a story that uh, people will never get tired of reading about it particularly from a first-person point of view. You get out and explore it. Brandywine Falls, for example, the park there just reopened for this uh, season. It had been closed off during the winter. And that stretch between Brandywine Falls and the south end of Whistler, it comes right out to where the Olympic Village, uh, it's called Chicamas Crossing now, but it was where the Athletes Village was at the south end. That is just an impeccable trail, just as Brad Laney was demonstrating there in his wheelchair and he was saying, you don't have to be disabled. You can you know, just do this with a stroller you know, or on a bike or you know, however you want to do it. It is a superb trail. Interesting seeing the waterfront in Squamish. That's right where the fire was a couple of days ago down at the uh, Nexon Beach. Uh, it, it, the fire didn't affect the, uh, the trail. It's over on uh, where a terminal is, where uh, some large ocean-going uh, freighters pull in to 
take on lumber, but uh, that, that's definitely going to be hit for the uh, for the commercial uh, waterfront in in Squamish for the next little while. Okay, could we go back to the one here? Anybody who ever really wanted to get involved with uh, ecotourism from a business point of view might be interested to know Mulville Creek, just south of uh, Revelstoke. It's a really interesting story. I wish I had more pictures to put up. You can see uh, the mountain in Revelstoke where the ski operation is just in behind there, Mount Mackenzie. This is a really interesting story, and uh, it's very typical. A couple from uh, Switzerland, their, their last name is Hoopy, and they call themselves the Happy Hoopies. And uh, they won awards for their lodge that they started, bed and breakfast, hardworking Swiss. They um, put in a, li a little micro power uh, generator on Mulville Creek, which runs just up in the hill behind the, where this photograph was taken here. It's completely self-powered, self-sustaining. They go year round. They have, uh, I mean, it's a, it's an all-in package. They have canoeing and biking. They have fishing in the summertime. You catch a fish, and uh, Renee Hoopy will cook uh, will cook it up herself. Uh, it's it's really a splendid operation. And when I went to their website, it's for sale. Oh, oh my God! <laughs> so that's why I say anybody who's looking for an opportunity to get into the ecotourism business, you know, they started in '86. Here it is, 30 years later. I think they're they're ready to, uh, you know, just enjoy uh, sitting back and seeing more of British Columbia. As uh, Emily Carr said, you know, that's what we all, as British Columbians, love to do is just see BC. The Swiss are great, eh? You see them all over the north of part of British Columbia, and. You can understand why. When you go to Switzerland, it's, it's so beautiful, but it's also, I was surprised to learn, the most densely populated country in sure. Europe. I always thought it was Holland, right? But uh, the Swiss come here and they just, they can't get over how much empty space there is. Uh, I want to finish up with showing a really unique, uh, what I consider one of the most unique ecotourism locations in Western Canada. And that's... At uh, one of Canada's first national parks. This is. You know this park? Yes. That's the Prince of Wales Hotel. And I took one look at this picture 35 years ago and I said, that's where I want to get married. Uh, and unfortunately, we already had set our wedding date for September 20th, and the place closed on September 14th. Oh, so no. <laughs> it took a little while to get back. It's in the very southwest corner of British of Alberta, right on the eastern slopes of the Rockies, right at the Continental Divide. It's a and uh, it's south of a little town called Pincher Creek. If you know, on Highway Three that cuts across of going over towards Crow's Nest Pass. Do you have more slides? Yeah, let's do another okay. slide. Okay, sure. <laughs> I, I, I put in a few more slides here to really give a sense of this area. Because this is, as the sign says, this is where the, the mountains meet the prairies. And we're looking due south here into Montana. And I love the story of this park. Uh, not only was it uh, one of the first, along with Banff and Jasper National Park, it was created by a fellow known as Kootenay Brown. And that's where our name in British Columbia, the Kootenays, come from. He was a very famous uh, guide, and um, he was the one, along with a, another guide, who championed the formation of this park. Why don't we go to another slide here? It's this beautiful series of lakes, the largest of which run down into that Glacier National Park in the United States, in Montana, at the other end of this lake. And in the 1930s, the Rotary International Clubs decided that what better example of peaceful coexistence could there be than creating an international peace park. And that's what, uh, between the uh, Waterton Lakes National Park and Glacier National Park, they are classified as the world's only international peace park. Uh, people come from all over the world. The Chinese are fascinated by what has been accomplished between two countries peacefully coexisting, as exemplified by the International Peace Park in the lake here. And one of the things that I like, Mary, is if you can give us another slide here. You can take a walk, and I love crossing borders. Borders are so artificial, aren't they? There's a walk that starts in the little town of Waterton and runs all the way to the south end of Waterton Lake, upper Waterton Lake. 
to a place called Goat Hunt, which is just a little rancher station. But it's a beautiful 18 kilometer walk that you can do in the course of a day. Or if you want to backpack and, to, and be self supported, there's some lovely little camp spots like this one along the way. And the next spot, next slide, you can actually walk down the lake in the course of a day and then come back on this lovely 1920s boat. What is it, the Enterprise? The International. The International, <coughs> uh, which has got a, uh, a running. They have uh, a guy who's uh, speaking the whole way. It takes about an hour, I guess, to come from one end of the lake to the other. And uh, they're talking about the geological features. and uh, it's, it's quite neat. So you can either, you know, just ride the boat down to Goat Hunt and back, or, as I would prefer you to do, get out and walk and explore, because it's a very gentle trail. Really, it's not a lot of up and downing at all. It's mostly just at Lakeside. And one of the things about being at Lakeside is you can see a lot of wildlife. This is, this is, a, fellow, this is a fellow who leads tours down in Waterton Lakes in June. He's, his name is John Russell. His father was a well-known um, ecologist, Andy Russell, who started off uh, guiding uh, bear hunting and then realized that what he'd rather do is guide people rather than with guns, take them on uh, with cameras. And he's just legendary. Andy Russell passed away a couple of years ago. I met him at a, at a writer's conference in, in Waterton Lakes and he told this, this story that was so wild and then one of the people at the uh, conference leaned over and said, Andy, is that true? And Andy looked at him and he said, you know, sometimes the truth can be terribly dry. <laughs> he was kind of like Farley Mowat in that regard, right? Like, don't let the truth get in the way of telling a good story sometimes. <laughs> anyway, John uh, leads tours. Uh, it's wildflower season in uh, June and early July in Waterton Lakes is spectacular. Here's like some Indian paintbrush on one side and some mountain avas on the avens on the other. Next, please. And of course, one of the things about national parks is you're going to see wildlife. Uh, this was uh, just right in the uh, campground at the national park with the, uh, the deer, and uh, the bear was a little further away in a, a Red Creek Canyon. It's just the best little park. Okay. So that's the end of my presentation. But you know, people are always asking me, what are you reading these days? Who are the authors that you like? So I thought I'd throw in a couple of uh, little suggestions for you. This is a Australian author, Michelle de Kressler, who I really, Kretzer, who I really like. And she's got a book out uh, within the last year or so. It's available through the Vancouver Public Library. And it's called Questions of Travel. And it's a fictional story um, set first half in Europe and the second half back in Sydney, Australia. But she poses some really interesting questions. Uh, the main character in the book, Laura, writes guidebooks. And the more she writes guidebooks, the more questions that she has about, okay, well, what is the purpose of travel? <laughs> you know, what are, it, it's like another author that I like, uh, Terrace Grasco. Anybody know him? He's local. His dad, Paul, uh, and his mom, Audrey, live out on Bowen Island. Uh, and his book, uh, The End of Elsewhere, really looks at the whole history of tourism, traveling and looking around, rather than going from point to point and how it started the whole history, but how these days through Lonely Planet guides and uh, guidebooks like that, uh, there really isn't much left on the planet that hasn't been explored yet. So I would suggest uh, have a look at Taris Gresco's book. Another book that I'm reading right now, and I should have put it up as well, uh, an author that I've just become aware of, Rebecca Solnit. She's written a book, oh, a lot of books, A Field Guide to Getting Lost. <laughs> Great book. What's your last name? Solnit, S-O-L-N-I-T. Go to the Vancouver Public Library, put in a hold, and then wait six months. Her books are really popular. I'm reading another one of hers right now called Wanderlust, uh, which is a history of walking. And walking trails, like the Sea to Sky that we saw, like the Trans-Canada Trail, uh, there are more trails 
uh, right now under construction, I think it's a really interesting clue to a new direction in travel. Uh, and so I think there's a wealth of story material out there for you to explore. And I would just finally like to encourage you, any questions that you might have, this is my partner in creativity who I'm ogling. <laughs> that's, uh, that's my wife, Louise. And uh, she takes all of the photographs for our books and our columns. Uh, go to our website to check out what it is that we do. You'll find a lot more information there. And if you have any questions whatsoever, we love